next case is Dr. Al Tieb, if I'm saying that name wrong, I apologize. Uh, reverse Akron Nephrology Associates. Each party will have 15 minutes to present their argument. The appellant may reserve up to five minutes for rebuttal. Count you to how long you'd like to reserve at this point. Yes, Your Honor, three minutes, please. Okay, very good. I will be keeping track of that up here. I will try to let you know when we're down about a minute in your time. If you're looking up here, it's a little confusing when the top circle gets to three minutes, you'll be in your rebuttal time. So, just so you know that. The arguments are, again, the arguments will be recorded. As we mentioned, when you present your argument, make sure you come to the podium. Please introduce yourself. Please speak loud enough so we can hear you. And please try to stay behind the podium because you lose you on the video if you keep moving back and forth. Do not use the name of any child, minor, or victim in this case. I don't think that it applies here, but in case it would apply, please do not do that. Uh, we refer them by initials or some other term like the child. Otherwise, we've read your brief and we're ready to prepare to proceed whenever you want. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, counsel. I'm John Hill with the Lewis Brisbois firm. I represent the appellant, Akron Nephrology. We sometimes refer to them as ANA, although we'll try to avoid that alphabet soon. Uh, this court, Your Honors, should correct several errors that created the judgment below. Uh, we have two assignments of error. Two, the first two address things that happened at trial. The second to address post-trial issues. At the heart of this uh, appeal and uh, injustice from our perspective is the verdict. Um, ANA's liability in this case was only contract-based and specifically it arose from the failure to buy Dr. El Tayeb's shares under a buyout agreement. Any proper verdict in this case had to apply the contract buyout formula, which Dr. El Tayeb's expert repeatedly said was a simplistic formula. He said that several times in his brief testimony. At essence, if Dr. El Tayeb was found to have retired, then the evidence, the contract, and math only permitted one of two verdicts. It was $306,830 if we were averaging the last three years of only clinical compensation, or it was $702,994 if we were averaging the last three years of clinical compensation plus the medical director's fees that the doctors earn, what we call MBA fees. Everyone agreed throughout trial that it was either one input or two inputs going into this formula. Unfortunately, our jury divided notably six to two, rendered a verdict of 451,607. They did that even while saying in one of their interrogatories that they were applying the contract formula. No one since then has ever pointed the trial court or this court to evidence supporting that verdict or that number. No one has ever said, here are the numbers you add up and average over three years to get to 451,607. And we submit that there was clearly an error made in math, or we had an impermissible compromise verdict here by a six to two jury. And if our court rules and our jury instructions are gonna have meaning, that verdict cannot stand. Under assignment number one, we argue that the court should reverse the verdict and judgment under Civil Rule 59A-5, an error in the amount of recovery in a contract case, as well as 59A-6, which provides that a verdict has to be supported by competent, substantial, and credible evidence. This court has the power and should remit the verdict to 306,830, the lower of the two numbers that we disagreed about, and order Dr. El Tayeb that he needs to accept that or a new trial would be had. We cited you case law, I believe out of Ninth District, the first case, which says that this court has the power to do that. So there is basically a difference of $145,000. In the verdict amount. 
Yes. And we've spent hours and hours and hours trying to figure out where that number comes from, Your Honor, and we can't do it. And no one's done it for any court. And you said that this is obviously different, in your opinion, from a personal injury or some type of case, because this is all contractual, so you can't just come up with figures on your own. Yes, it's math. I don't, unlike, you know, if someone is injured and we're trying to figure out, you know, what's the, what's the value of the quality of life that they lost, the jury is permitted to come up with a number within any reasonable spectrum. This is not that case. It's a contract-based civil case. I'm going to ask you, um, I see no record of mediation at our court. Was that ever instigated? I, I don't remember it, if that was. I'm sorry, it, it was back uh, the first appeal. At the first appeal. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, we, we were sent back down and came back up and it was done at the first one. Okay. So after it was sent back up, there's no more attempt there to There has mediation. not been. No. Thank you. Plaintiff claimed on the remitter argument that one of the requirements for remitter is that he has to, plaintiff has to agree to do that, and he's not agreeing to do that in this case. If he did not agree, we still have the authority to order a, a number? I don't believe he can. I believe that he has to choose, which he has never been forced to do. Dr. Ellis Head has to choose to either accept a lower number, or all you could do, or any court could do then, is say, okay, well then we're going to have to try. Does that answer in that you? regard, In that regard, then, if the other remedy would be a new trial if we were to find that there's nothing to support the jury decision because they had to pick A or B in this particular case. Yes. Yes. Uh, we briefed, you know, Dr. Al Tayyab's arguments on why the verdict is supported by evidence. He's never done the math for either court, but you know, one of the things he says is, well, there was evidence of other settlements with other doctors in prior years. That literally cannot be support for this judgment. It would be an error, a reversible error, if that's what the jury did, um, right? If, if I have a contract that says, I'll sell you my house for the average of the last three houses that sold on our street, but then you said, well, I'm gonna give you the last three houses that sold five years ago. That doesn't comply with the contract. You don't get to do that, a jury couldn't do it. And that, I think, is what Dr. al is trying to argue here, and it would not be proper if they relied on those other settlements. Those other settlements were relevant to liability issues, but not damages. And Dr. al never even made that argument at, 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 at the court level. Um, so we believe that this court should order a remitter along the lines that we have discussed under assignment number one. So you're saying that we should order it back to the trial court for the court to give option of or a new trial. You could, although as I read the Burke case, you have the power to just make that order yourself. That this verdict, that the appellate court, according to Burke, can say the evidence only supports the lower number and does not support this number, and you could make the order that he has to accept that or a new trial. You could remand as well, but I, I believe you have the power to do that in the cases we've cited. Thank you. Um, I, I think we get to the same place anyway. On assignment two, it has to do with the proposed interrogatory that we requested and did not obtain. Uh, Your Honor, Rule 49, Civil Rule 49B requires that the court shall submit proper interrogatories unless they're improper in form and content. We knew going into this case there were really only two issues for the jury to decide. One, did he retire within the meaning of the contract? And if they found in favor of Dr. El Tayyab on that, then the second question was, well, what's compensation mean for purposes of valuing him? And we knew that there was this dispute about Dr. El Tayyab saying, well, compensation includes the MDA fees, even though he had in the past said compensation does not include MDA fees. We wanted the jury to have to confront that issue directly and answer an interrogatory. Do you find that MDA income should be included in compensation? That's directly relevant to one of the two key issues in the case. It was not improper in form or content, and notably the trial court never said that it was. Uh, in the trial court, did the trial court at any point give you a reason why it did not accept the uh, interrogatory? Certainly, the 
the rules seem to contemplate they can accept it, at least as not, not accept it as to form. They could say to you folks, the form is inappropriate, try again. Agreed. But they, there was no time where they made any indication that what the rationale was wrong. I saw only two places in the transcript, transcript page 80, 854 and transcript page 871, where interrogatories were discussed on the record, and there's no reason given. The one doesn't even really address this interrogatory. The other one does not give a reason. It's, it, 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 and we looked. Uh, so I thought, I'm sorry, go ahead. Finish. No, go ahead. No, I just thought that uh, I read somewhere in the briefs that the explanation was that it was uh, duplicative, that it was redundant, there was no need for it. I believe that's Dr. El Tayeb's position. That, but the court never said that? I did not see okay. a citation anywhere in the record to that, and I don't believe it's in the record. I've cited those two pages specifically because I, I was looking. Uh, we've cited you the McNulty case at page 23 of our open brief that establishes that this error, failure to give that interrogatory under these circumstances, is reversible error. And it would have avoided this problem, sadly. Um, and so we think it's another grounds to reverse this judgment. I'd like to now move to the last two errors, which have to do with the two post-trial rulings we've taken issue with. And I, it's important to note that the error, assignment error of error number three deals with the attorney fees, which in our view were essentially doubled over what they could have been at most. And the failure, even if this is uh, sent back, I, I mean, the. The error at the attorney fee level we find to be clear and, and significant. Um, attorney fees, there was no finding of punitive damages, there was no statute. Attorney fees are in this case only because a, of a con, the Akron Nephrology buyout agreement. You, you have, have one minute left in your initial time, by the way. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> if you go over and You're, talk, if you go over and talk with a take on rebuttal time, that's up to you. Yeah, you're right. The, you told me I was going to be confused yeah. by that, and I was. Uh, the prevailing party clause specifically says you get the fees to enforce this agreement. And it's undisputed that he brought other tort claims under other agree under contract other contracts against five other defendants. He litigated for 20 months with AKI and CBC. He negotiated lengthy settlement agreements with them. The only time, the only circumstance in this case where the court could have awarded all of those fees under this prevailing party clause was if there was a proper finding that all of those claims were inextricably intertwined, which I think means you can't separate them out. And I can't separate my time out. And two points. One is the trial court never made that finding. The trial court's order does not say these were inextricably intertwined. It says instead, well, these all involve the same people and essentially related to the nephrology practice. Secondly, we know that they were able to be unwound because it happened. The evidence that Dr. El Tayeb put in shows his lawyers dozens of entries working on the other cases and other claims. Yet all of those were awarded to him. And it literally doubled by about $145,000 or $150,000 the fees that he should have obtained if he had a valid judgment. I'll close there and try to save two minutes of my time. Unless there are questions. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. You have the remaining time left for rebuttal, counsel. Thank you. May it please the court, Alex McCallion from Brennan, Manna, and Diamond on behalf of FLE, Dr. Babakar El Tayeb. Before I start, uh, based on Attorney Hill's comments, do you have any questions right out of the gate? Uh, I'd like to address assignment of error number one. Uh, essentially what the appellant is arguing 
nephrology is that there was no competent and credible evidence for the jury to come up with that damages figure. And that is a factual dispute that uh, we clearly disagree with. And this will be, uh, this is under an abuse of discretion standard, the trial court denying their motion. Uh, the parties, I think, all agreed, and the trial court agreed, that the issue here is that the term compensation in this agreement on when you average the past three years' compensation was not a defined term. It was an ambiguous term, which allowed parole evidence for the jury to hear two weeks of trial testimony on what did these three partners in acronephrology mean by the word compensation. Dr. L. Tyad. This is a contract. Did the contract decide or define compensation in some regards? It did not at all, which is what. So it just simply said he'll get compensation if he retires. It didn't say anything more than that? It says an average of the last three years' compensation. Okay. Lowercase, not defined, not defined anywhere in the contract. So the jury was left with making the decision of what dollar figures go into compensation. Dr. El Tayeb had one opinion. Uh, the jury he had an expert that had an opinion. Acronephrology had a different opinion. And the jury, when trying to determine what what does compensation mean for these people, heard a slew of evidence and received a mountain of financial records from both the practice, they had all the practice uh, groups returns, they had individual month-by-month -month breakdowns of each member's clinical compensation, their bonuses, their medical director compensation, and then they also heard the reason the, the past buyouts were pertinent in this case is because this word compensation is not defined, prior doctors had been bought out of this practice. So that is where the discussion on, well, what did you guys do for the past doctors? Because they were bought out under this same agreement, and what, what were you operating on for compensation back then? So, did so you Just so I understand then, the, the appellant makes the argument that all through trial you argued it was either 300 roughly or 700, and both sides are saying it's either A or B. And you're telling me at trial you were saying it could be anywhere in between A or B, Jerry, you figure it out. Our argument was it was only the higher one. <laughs> Not surprising necessarily, <laughs> but okay. Yes, and then uh, I believe in closing arguments we also said, but under a worst case scenario, Dr. El Tayeb is at minimum entitled to their argument, but give us the, the obviously the bigger number. But the jury was left with this question of what is compensation, and they determined uh, that it was a number between what we said and what uh, acronephrology said. But but the problem with that is, just like they're arguing, is if both sides say there is a contract, and you can interpret <coughs> this term that's undefined or ambiguous or whatever by bringing in evidence, okay, and that evidence it either amounts to, I don't remember exactly, 750 or 306. How does the jury just go off on their own then? It sounds like they may have been considering other factors. Well, the other factors that they were considering well, were the past practices of the practice and how did you define this before you came to trial? Because now that you're in trial, one side's going to argue compensation means the biggest. But but I assume you all both argue that. You both argue what those figures were and how you got to your high figure, and they argued how they got to their low figure. So I'm just having a little trouble understanding how a jury comes up with a completely different number when it's not related to like something that's, um, you know, like pain and suffering or something. So the financials that they, the jury were provided included uh, on a doctor by doctor basis, their monthly salaries for different categories. So for instance, uh, clinical for seeing patients, medical director, and also bonus compensation. So the jury could have, for example, said, we don't deem that bonuses are part of your compensation when doing this. And there was no interrogatory proposed to the jury saying, what, how did you come up with your number? Or what, what categories do you consider as compensation? That question. Well, that goes to assignment error two with interrogatory number three. So they're saying that's exactly what they asked for, but you're saying it's not true. It was not, and that was actually, uh, it's quoted in uh, Acronephrology's brief. The judge actually said on the record, no one submitted anything asking for them to play out their entire calculation. So, and then it, the audio trails off. Uh, but that actually uh, is our point in arguing assignment error number two. But there is a difference between saying actual calculation. I don't know that they're asking for the actual, actual calculation. They're asking for a d definition of what they consider to be compensation. 
So uh, to that, their proposed interrogatory asks for a portion. It's a, uh, it's a, a, in our view, a confusing and incomplete interrogatory because it didn't say, show us your calculation or show us, jury, write in every factor that you considered in compensation. It asks, do you find by preponderance that medical director agreement income should be included in compensation to calculate the purchase price? I believe the judge's point was, well, that's only one factor for the jury to consider, and it's a factor that acronephrology is saying shouldn't be considered at all. So it was an incomplete question. When and you say you, I'm sorry to interrupt. Oh, no, no. I, I just, when you're done with that, explain where that is in the record, if you would, because they indicate there's nothing in the record that explains how the court made her. her I, I apologize. That's a transcript uh, 871. Thank you. So uh, it's our opinion uh, and our argument that the judge did not abuse her discretion in rejecting that. And that when she did reject that, if they wanted a, a acronephrology wanted a complete uh, interrogatory addressing compensation, the burden was on uh, acronephrology to propose a new one for the court that said, for example, uh, ask the jury to show us your math on how you came up with the number or list the factors that went into compensation. The one, the one that was proposed did not do that. And moving on to assignment of error number three, the attorney's fees award. Uh, this too is under an abuse of discretion standard, so uh, it's, a, it's a two part analysis. The first part is whether the contract allows for attorney's fees. It's de novo, and both sides here agree the contract does. So, whether, uh, so the court's decision on the amount of attorney's fees is under an abuse of discretion standard uh, under the Ninth District precedent in four Illyria Company versus Brexton. The trial court's decision on attorney's fees, I think, uh, exemplified its opinion perfectly when it, uh, it quoted the case law that the trial court's authorized to award attorney's fees on the total work performed if the prevailing party's claims uh, present a common core of facts and related theories. That's under Flesher versus George, a Ninth District case as well. And here what the trial court ruled uh, and what occurred is that we had the same facts, the same witnesses, and the same work for all of these claims because, the, uh, for example, two of the defendants were uh, Dr. Tan and Dr. Zid, which are the other two partners. There were breach of fiduciary duty claims against them that operated under the same common core of facts as the breach of contract claim, which is simply put, hey, you didn't buy me out like you should have in the contract. You breached your fiduciary duty for doing that, and you should have bought me out under the contract. So the court, after hearing uh, evidence on the record, there was a full hearing on attorney's fees, both sides presented expert witnesses, and uh, all of the line item by line item, point one hour fees were listed, and the trial court ultimately determined uh, that all of the fees were intertwined. And that is why we think under the abuse of Did she actually use that terminology and is strictly intertwined? She, uh, I do not believe she used it. I think she quoted Flesher and used the phrase common core of facts and related legal theories. Well, you can have a common core of facts and legal theories without the mean and trick inextricably intertwined, correct? I, I believe you can. Okay, and so that seems to be what they're arguing, that yes, there were common facts, but at the same rate, um, you can divide them up because there actually was um, some evidence that, that showed how the attorneys had uh, built separately. And uh, our argument here is the same as it was at the trial court, is that you can't do that. It's because they were so inextricably intertwined that you cannot separate them out uh, as their, uh, their expert attempted to do on the stand and through briefing and the trial court disagreed with uh, their expert's opinion that you could untangle all of the time entries. You have five minutes left. You're the middle one. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> if you look up there, sorry. Keep, yeah, so you're in the middle one. You have about one more five minutes left. And uh, for the final assignment of error, number four, uh, which is also, this is, relates to the prejudgment interest and whether or not interest should uh, be at a contractual rate or at a uh, statutory rate. The court, uh, under the abuse of discretion standard, ruled that prejudgment interest at the statutory rate begins on May 15, 20, 2017. Uh, and on this, the main point that we're attempting to make through our briefing in here is that the contract itself did not have a set interest rate. There was no signed promissory note dictating an interest rate. 
what the, the, the buyout agreement had, or the shareholders agreement, it said if ANA, if a shareholder retires, they, ANA will do the math, then ANA will sign this promise, will sign a promissory note, and will pay you out at this interest rate. Akron Nephrology never got to step one because they argued with Dr. El Tayeb over whether he was retiring. So first they said he wasn't retiring, then they disputed compensation, so there was no promissory note signed that had a set interest rate. Because there was no promissory note signed with a set interest rate, under RC 1343.03a, the fallback provision is, all right, you don't have a set interest rate, then you go to the interest, the statutory interest rate in 5703.47. And that is what the trial court did. It said there is no, the shareholder agreement does not have a set interest rate, so therefore it is the 5% that was the statutory interest rate. That concludes my remarks. Are there any additional questions? Yeah. I, um, you didn't look at mediation this time around. Do you think that'd be beneficial? I do when not. you have the, the mediator contact you. I do not believe it would. In this case, the parties have had a long and tortured history. Okay. The case has gone on for seven years now. Um, I, it, we've tried it informally in the past as well. I, I don't think it would be beneficial. Could go on for another seven years. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you. And you have a minute, 50 roughly. Thank you, Your Honor. You're welcome. Uh, <clears throat> I'll only uh, revisit, I think, two points absent questions from the panel. Uh, on attempting to explain or and the verdict. For the first time here, we heard, well, maybe the jury went in and picked out a number and said, this bonus shouldn't apply. Um, that's not evidence. No one even made that argument below. Um, but what would prevent them from doing that? If you have all these different numbers of, you know, three years, okay, and for whatever reason, they just say, well, you know, I don't think you should be entitled to the bonus for that year. Because that's, they are charged with enforcing a contract. And the contract said the buyout price shall be the average of three years annual compensation. Annual compensation. And the only dispute ever, even reasonably, that could have been had is, well, does annual compensation include MDA fees or not? Nobody did, or I would assume it could, come up with their own thought of, well, annual compensation for these doctors under this agreement didn't include bonuses, right? When we have a, an allegedly ambiguous term, the jury then is told, well, you need to get to the intent of the parties. No party testified, I didn't mean for bonuses to be included. Dr. Altaya didn't. Dr. Altaya only said, I, despite having said the four MDA fees are not included, I think they should be included. Dr. Altaya's expert said you should go to their W-2, right? So I don't think a jury under the guise of, well, let's look for contractual intent can go off on those things. And I think there has to be something in the record to support that. Okay, there were no stipulations. I don't think the none that touched but, on this. But issue. basically, you both argued the same thing, and this is the issue. Yes. Yes. You, and I know you're out of time. I will say, um, since you had some confusion, you want to very briefly make your second point. You very briefly make your second point. I will. Thank you for that, Your Honor. Um, the abuse of discretion issue. Unsurprisingly, you heard repeatedly, well, this is an abuse of discretion standard. But, you know, we've cited you case law, Harris and Gallagher, both are cases, and the Gallagher case out of our district, saying that where a trial court makes a legal conclusion like this and doesn't have any stated reasoning process and there's no record of the evidence, that is an abuse of discretion. I think counsel, understandably, tried to rewrite the order for the court. Thank, thank you for your point. Okay, thank you.
I have to ask you a question. Oh. I ask him too. Mediation. Uh, I feel the same as he does. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, we have talked a lot. That's fine. Yeah. That's fine. Thank you. The court will take the matter under advisement and issue a decision in due course. Also, be available on the High Supreme Court's website. With that, on behalf of the court, I'd like to thank both of you today.